Razak Khan. Let's let's enlarge him. Let's see, uh, make him huge here. Razak, so we'll see your face. Oh, and together with Phil oh. me. Okay, so Razak, I'm going to briefly introduce you. Um, so Razak Khan is a research fellow at the Center for Modern Indian Studies, University of Göttingen, Göttingen Germany. He researches and writes about the social, cultural, intellectual, and effective history of South Asian Muslims in modern India and Germany. His monograph, Minority Pasts, Locality, Emotions, and Belonging in Princely, Princely Rampur is forthcoming with Oxford University Press. Okay, we talked, I think, before, uh, before you got the, the press uh, on it. So Oxford University Press, fantastic. Uh, this year, is it out already? Uh, it's out. It should it's out. be reaching me next month, a week, I think. <laughs> okay. It's in, it's in post. It's out of press, but it's in post. <laughs> okay, fantastic. So, Razak, thank you for joining us. You are concluding our day. It was a very interesting, productive day. We talked about many, many things. And now we're going to talk about your views on what we have called quite provocatively uh, decolonizing empathy. Right? And, well, you know, the, the, there's a whole discourse of decolonization, post-colonization, anti-colonization that is quite, um, well, it's, it's, it's going right now in universities. And there are many things which are being decolonized. So I wanted to, for you to introduce us, the audience today, maybe in a rudimentary way before we get into the we dirty our hands and start working. If you could introduce us to this notion in general, what does it mean to decolonize something? And then maybe more generally, because you will be very specific with this particular example, but why or how can we decolonize something like empathy? Mm -hmm. So let's start with that. Okay, thank you, Leon, for organizing this. Uh... I'm a historian, so I, I try to think, come from the perspective of history to the category of the social theory, which I think is greater concern. And one might think of psychoanalysis as a productive way of bringing a lot of these disciplinary binaries into conversation. So let's think of decolonizing, decolonization as a desire rather than as an academic category because I think that would then take us to disciplinary approaches. Um, the way I think of the desire or the need for decolonization is in fact uh, one that is in a strange attachment and in conflict with how do we write universal. Uh, so if one were to think of modernity and its universal processes, one might in fact think of colonialism from that paradigm. Yeah, so if one might think of colonialism itself as a way of creating universal or what Chakravarti would call the globalization of the capital, the capital as a narrative of history. Now, if one were to think from that perspective rather than only political processes, so a historian would say colonialism happened because of these factors, these are the historical conditions. But if one were to move beyond a historical explanation to a social theory, at the core of colonial project, and this might be interesting to connect colonialism with empathy, is also a desire to create a discourse of universalization. Yes, yes. And of course, the colonial discourse or also the colonial practices were marked by uniformity, creating structures, modernization, uh, connectedness. Uh, what a lot of people are now calling global history. But one way to think of colonialisms and its own psychic desires, or at least projection of those desires, is to think of civilization, uh, colonial civilizing mission. So at the core of it, despite all the violence, was a discourse about, but this is of course for betterment. It, in fact, the colonial discourse would insist, uh, and Gayatri Spivak was important, speaker, at least in the post-colonial theory framework, talks very famously about colonial discourse of saving 
the brown woman from the brown men. <laughs> so this is her work on Sati, abolition of Sati. Now, what is interesting there is moving beyond what subsequently scholars like Dila Gandhi have said that instead of taking a post-colonial revenge, as she calls it, on colonial discourse, one might be interested in thinking of post-coloniality as if in fact also a deep attachment with the colonial discourse. Now, even think of somebody like Gandhi, uh, the one of the biggest speaker of anti-colonialism, his own journey to anti-colonialism happens through a deep identification with the colonial project, both in South Africa and India. In fact, what might see this move to anti-colonialism as saying, but the colonial government is not living up to its promise of colonial project, of uplifting us to democracy. So at the core of anti-colonialism is also deep identification or at least belief in colonial project. What I think anti-colonialism, and I'll come to post-colonial and decolonialism in a moment, is to understand that even anti-colonial projects are not opposite of colonial. They are in some way nationalization of the colonial universe. And so Gandhi's project then becomes not only anti-colonial, it also becomes nationalism. And that's why some of the conflict that we are witnessing in the post-colony are the remnant of colonial colonialism in post-colonial governmentality. So the point would then to be insist that colonialism does not end with colonization. Now, an argument was made that by 1947 with India's independence, a process of decolonization happened. What that effectively means is political transfer of power and you know, taking over of colonial regimes. Now, scholars have insisted that decolonization can't be a process that is only limited to change of power regime, but in fact, uh, it requires a fundamental change of the structure of colonial thought, what Ashish Gandhi would call colonization of self, yeah? loss of the, the intimate enemy, as he put it. Uh, so if colonization is not just of territory, but of mind and desire, then I think at the core of post-colonialism and decolonial desire, is a desire to think of colonialism as deeply both emotive, intellectual, and what might even call them psychic project. Mm -hmm. So unlike post-colonial theory, which for the longer time was still deeply attached to critique of colonial reason, decolonial turn more recently have emphasized that that's, the critique is not enough. We need to create alternative space in fact, remove the colonial discourse to a positionality of emphasizing what they call the discourse itself needs to be decolonized. Now, how that could be achieved depends on various methods. Uh, there are literary approaches, there are political theory approaches, and then there are also approaches based on conceptual transformation. Uh, what would be the new concept beyond what we have been given? So beyond Europe's capital, civilization, democracy discourse, secularism, for example, is a big conceptual debate. And there have been a lot of critique of what now is being called anti-secularist. So if you think of Saidian project, that is critical secularism within post-coloniality. But if you were to look at somebody like Talal Asad or his readers, they would in fact say that secularism is so embedded within those structures that one might need new concepts um, uh, and in that sense, sometimes the reading is seen as anti-secularist, but one of the productive way would be to think of their desire to create new concept. So not just, you know, in emphasizing a critique of secularism, but coming out with other forms of religious theology, what they would call political okay. uh, thought in dialogue with religion rather than against it. Because without that project like Islamism or Hindutva, <laughs> and this would be something we could discuss, would always be condemned as a reactionary moment. Mm -hmm. Some thread of decolonial theory will insist that these are also articulation from the colony that remains opposite to European categories. So they, uh, one thread thrust of decolonial theory, I think, uh, with which I disagree, uh, is the desire for indigeneity, or mm -hmm. at least concept from below or within. Now, 
what that project may look like is there is no consensus. What might be its political implication uh, is also not known, but what unites these desire is a desire to think outside of limiting Europe. So that's what the Bishop with this project of provincializing, but also thinking outside of Europe. So more thinking about concept from Africa or the global South. Mm -hmm. um, so those that I think would be the overall theoretical academic framing. But of course, these projects are also coming from activist uh, movement based project where they, they are, in, for example, in, emphasizing that the university itself is a colonial remnant and therefore the desire to remove colonial names or statues, both in England, but also in Africa are happening. So I would suppose that one could think of this as a desire to undo the intellectual remnants of colonialism or for that matter, even European thought. Mm -hmm. I see, I see. So in this sense, this desire will set the trajectory of our talk today. Uh, but before we get uh, we get to this concept that you've you've mentioned right now as an alternative as a as a, a product of decolonializing empathy, t tell us a little bit about your work in the field. Uh, bring us slowly into the, let's say the discussion about empathy and uh, Ambastagi. Yeah? Okay, so I, I suggested to Leon that instead of making it a uh, Globe rest of the world discussion where I've become the spokesperson for the rest of the Europe, which is a burden that uh, scholars from the rest of outside of Europe often are expected to carry. Uh -huh. I decided to not uh, go for a universal argument, but coming specifically from my own experience of living in and studying in Germany, uh, exactly. but also working in German academia. Uh, and in particular, I want to uh, emphasize some of the work I did for the Center for History of Emotion, uh, which was an important center that was built around 2008. Now, I believe there are more centers outside of Germany, both in England and Australia. And at the center, there was great desire to also engage with particularly India-based concept. Uh, now, what, what that project looks like is that, you know, in those conceptual formulation of studying of emotion, uh, the desire is to think of alternative concept of emotion in India. Yeah, so India therefore becomes an alternative site to bring new concept because there's a great academic desire to not be Eurocentric. So this is a worthy effort. However, the problem becomes when the, the other example remains always a site of learning from the difference or what else is happening. And I began to see that this kind of work on India is not entirely helpful because it becomes a comparative framework without actually a more connected reading. Uh, so more recently, I have, after that work, I have started working in a different project called Modern Indian German Archive, which was interesting for me because it started thinking of India and Germany within Germany. So we were looking at histories of South Asian Muslim in particular. That's what, that's what my assigned job was within German thought. And I've been looking at uh, anti-colonial scholar in Germany who moved to Germany to think with Europe, not against Europe. So for mm -hmm. that formulation, German thought becomes different from British imperial thought because Germany was in that sense in conflict with England. More recently, I, I thought that this kind of exploration about the archival connection is often not important. So I completely unplanned, I happened to start working with a group on Afghan refugees in Berlin. And I, of course, knew of Afghan's presence in German archive. So you would find Afghan prisoners of war recording both in the sound archive in Humboldt, but also at Göttingen University. In fact, now the state of Niedersachsen has commissioned a project to sort of recover uh, these voices from the archive and make a public exhibition. And I've been part of that because the desire is to make something uh, legible with Afghan refugee presence in the current moment. And we were trying to sort of create a narrative where this empathy for the refugee is replaced by the argument of uh, 
Afghan's long presence in German history. So the project is called Not My War, uh, Nicht Mein Krieg. But of course, it is about Afghans' prisoners of war being recorded and employed within German histories of colonialism and imperial politics. It's with this context that I, I stumbled upon something which was unplanned and I will not read the paper, although it is part of a forthcoming publication, but I'll share some visual out of this project. It's a more historical anthropology based project based on both archival work but also participant observation. And I, I, I really appreciated the previous conversation where my, one might think of participant observation and its own ethics of empathy. And I want to come to some of the point that we raised, which were about strategic empathy, ethical empathy, shifting empathy during the method of actually having a dialogue uh, is, so that's a methodological question we can come to, but perhaps beyond my word, I could share some image if that's possible. I'm going to try and share. Okay, I can't share screen. It seems. Yeah, just one second. Yeah. And you're set. Okay. Now you can share. Okay, let's see. Okay. Is my screen visible at this stage? Yes. Okay. So here I would like to bring a concept of humbustigi, which is a concept I encountered in various sites. I'll explain this in a moment, but this is also part of a project that I wrote for uh, excellence. In, you know, all German universities are of course obsessed with excellence grants <laughs> and the Berlin universities in particular. So this is part of a call for a critical new concept called social cohesion that was announced a couple of years ago. And uh, I was asked to present in the project and I was not very comfortable with this category. So I suggested I'll work with concept that I find in Berlin rather than what was proposed by the university. So I, I turned to the concept of Hambastagi, a concept that I encountered among Afghan migrant communities in Berlin. I refuse, I'm not calling them refugees, but migrant, because this is a concept that you see also in earlier generation and not just the recent migrants. So this is a concept I encounter first, actually at a Afghani restaurant, very close to my house in Müllerstrasse, very close to what is, has been recently studied and criticized the Afrikanische Viertel or the neighborhood in Wedding District uh, with names street name named after different countries, particularly German colonies. Mm. But, but you also have examples, something like Turkenstrasse next to Togo Strasse. But this restaurant is on the historic Müllerstrasse, famously painted also by Cathy Kolwitz in 1920s and 30s for its working class history. Of course, the new working class of Berlin are now migrant bodies. So you find this restaurant. What I found interesting was it was very visibly written as an Afghanish restaurant, something that I had not encountered earlier. Often refugees or communities that come from particularly debated places hide behind other categories. So they would often write themselves as Indian restaurant. Bangladeshi's mm -hmm. restaurant, for example, routinely write themselves as, as Indian restaurant. Now, what is interesting here is that Kabul night invokes a presence of Kabul, a city under both cultural but also musical prohibition. And this place tries to create some of those prohibitionary uh, possibilities in Berlin. Uh, so this is something you also notice in other places like Baraka, which is a, a restaurant, but also a supermarket. And the interiority of these places the self-representation intrigued me. Uh, here you can see image from the supermarket. So they also retain the script, Dari and Pashto, you know. And this, this I thought was an interesting moment in their self-representation. This I had not noticed in the early Afghan places, which would be often marketed through Germany, German language representation. Two recent example in the, in the last years, crisis in Afghanistan, 
and the protest movement, you noticed uh, you, here you can see also invocation of the Afghanistan resistance movement, which is also called Hambastagi, a category uh, that can mean various things. I would call it social solidarity, sociality, but in political terminology, it becomes resistance and solidarity movement. And you find the political symbolism of this represented both in Afghan supermarket, but also this is another image from the Dongguang or the Asia market in Lichtenberg. Again, interesting to think about how communities are creating their own forms of political visibility, but I would also call it a desire to create their own emotional geographies. All right. The word humbastigi was, I also encountered it in two other domains apart from these community spaces. One was a uh, political protest, a major political protest that happened outside Brandenburg Gate last year. And you see here again, the political uh, resonance of it. So humbastigi as a political category of invoking political solidarity, international, both, I, I would hesitate to call it international empathy because what they desired was not empathy for Afghans, but recognition of Afghans question within German public sphere, the Hebamasian promise of a rational public sphere. So insisting on Germans political responsibility, particularly for those who had worked for German state. And the other are certain cards that I collected in a kind of, well, the way the event was described was a support group for migrant Afghans who were feeling what they call protest exhaustion by going to these protests. So I don't know if you can see them in detail. A lot of these are cards that Afghan uh, migrant, particularly young migrant wrote about the experience of political work in Germany and what that entails and what they what that leaves them with. So here you see both narration of exhaustion, but also a desire to be not just seen always perpetually as the refugee, as the one who needs support, but a desire to be often just seen as human or equal, uh, to be taken out for a beer and not just be always supported through charity work. And we could look at it, we could discuss some of these points in the discussion. And I thought that was interesting because it allows within the activist scene, I think there's a desire that of supporting charity, you know, how can we help? Uh, and, but there's often on the flip side of that deep and I think committed empathy, ethical empathy, which often ends up creating the idea of the Afghan refugee that category itself, refugee, which is a collective category, which sort of then erases the individual story. And perhaps the person to bring into these conversations is Hannah Arendt too, on what that category does and what it takes away from the human subject. Okay. Uh, Masaka, did you go over these notes that in your research, do you know what yeah. they say? Yeah, so one of the words, for example, is hambastagi in below. That's the word that came in Fatsi Dari. Uh -huh. But the, you would also see uh, people talking about exhaustion uh -huh. and not being seen for, you know, I, I remember one conversation in particular with this teenager who said, I also just want to be acknowledged for my teenage anxiety <laughs> and not just for my political anxiety that the world has imposed to me. I also want to be noticed and spoken about my everydayness that seems to be days because of these unfortunate, spectacular political event. Um, there are also other notes about wanting to have pleasure and not just always therapy. So often some of us who offer therapy work, the desire was that this sort of ethical empathy sometime training because what they would rather have is a picnic so after this event we ended up actually having a public picnic because that is what often people wanted they wanted music they wanted poetry and they just didn't want just the support system that a lot of us thought would be the most ethical empathetic act 
So it's with this act that I, I in the article had suggested in the long version to think about what are the other ways of thinking of political empathy. In this case, of course, the most visible sign of it in contemporary Germany is the argument about welcoming, you know, that the refugees are always welcome. This is the refuge. One might even think of Berlin as a refugee city there. And the concept of solidarity. Uh, now, how do we create new concept where solidarity, which often comes from activist communist universalism in that sense, uh, progressive universalism, as opposed to colonial universalism, and bring other concepts like humbastigi, which are concepts used not just for political protest, but also for eating together, dancing together, inhabiting the social together. So at the core of humbastigi is not just support, but pleasure, uh, an element of parity rather than this hierarchical way of support, recognizing the unity rather than this place of coming to somebody with a sense of support. Um, and I want to end with this image because this is of course, solidarity itself is changing, uh, particularly towards refugees. And we know this, you know, the Afghans were subsequently replaced by the Syrian and the Syrians have now uh, being replaced by the Ukrainian. So there is at the core of this solidarity politics that despite, and I'm not suggesting that it is at the core, is also often alienating despite its very well-intentioned project. Uh, so I wonder, and in the essay I have argued, what are the different places, different ways of creating engagement that are not about rescuing, which in some ways strangely share affinities with colonial civilizational project, if we could save them. And so in that, that sense, even decolonial project or contemporary activist method do share something which is about an idea of rescue, a support. And just to sort of conclude, we, after this lecture, the university student actually came to the restaurant and they, they actually ate with the people. So this was, uh, a method we try to create where we didn't invite the staff of the restaurant who are all refugees or with migrant past, but we try to bring the classroom to the space and create ways of engagement through food, through sociality rather than solidarity. Uh, and I'm not suggesting that would save the problem, but I, it would be something that was raised previously what might be other ways of engaging? What might be other ways of not choosing a group to work on, but to perhaps work with them? Okay, so with this, I think I'll conclude. I hope this sort of at least gives a broader idea of where I come from, which is to create not just a critique of empathy, but to think with other possibilities of empathetic without a hierarchical model. So, this would of course change based on your engagement with your subject and with them rather than for them. Okay. Yes. So before we open uh, questions, I, I've, uh, I, I was hoping, Azak, maybe I, I can ask you for a certain yeah. act, pedagogical act, uh, just for the sake of, of me, uh, of my request, <laughs> let's say. Yeah. Can you put then, um, it, it seems, uh, again, correct me if I'm wrong, that the notion of hambastagi is a, a particular, particularized alternative to what, what uh, in, uh, in the, uh, let's say, in terms of decolonial, decolonial desire, uh, is a problematic universal empathy. And I wonder that if you if you situate these two one next to the other, and this is my request, that's a pedagogic request. What? How could you distinguish them then for us in in the sense of summarizing uh, your work uh, on this subject? I would say that it's not so much a question of distinguishing or separating this as the better model. What uh -huh. I was interested in. Is, and this is a point I often make with my scholarly friends who work on bringing concept from the global south, things that happen there, we need to know more about them. 
Yes. What I was interested in is what happens when the a subject from the global south has to inhabit Europe. In those situations, they can't be against Europe. They can't provincialize Europe. They, in fact, need to have a deep attachment with it. So a lot of the Afghan migrants, second and third generation, for example, their parents actually don't let them learn the language because this is the idea that the integration must also be marked by an isolation with your own culture, even language. So many, I mean, I have now learned that in the university. You, if you want, you can learn it in Humboldt because of its GDR past rooted also again in colonial politics. But the point is a lot of second and third generation Afghan actually are not allowed to learn their own language uh, by their own parents. So they often develop these, the only connection in those spaces then become food. So what I thought was interested was, interesting would be is to not think of political work within Afghan communities only for political pedagogy, a demand that often is asked of them if we can know their culture concept, their political organization, but about both the sites of integration, but also the casualties of integration as to how, what those places might be. This is why the field work for this project was not just done in political marches and, you know, support a group or, you know, what a lot of people called healing or mental health support group. But I thought it would be necessary to do it in places of leisure, comfort. So therefore the, the main site of field work becomes a restaurant where the, the refugee is not coming for political support, but coming to be seen as a consumer with a sense of pleasure. And similarly, I, it was very interesting for me, for me also, because with those encounter, it was also an act of political pedagogy for me as well, where you know I had to also reflect on why is there a desire to work on this, you know? the desire to know political concept and not write about everyday life of these people, because otherwise they always remain external to our inquiry. We need to know about their political histories rather than their, what often would be called as banal everyday history. So I suppose I'm suggesting here that hambastagi is a concept that is not just political in nature, it's everyday inness. So it's almost like inhabiting a place together. So neighborliness, eating together, it, and you encounter it in different sites, which then allows us to think of empathy not as something that you need to create or reflect in moments of crisis, but empathy also as something that one should think about in everyday interaction, you know? And how does one interact in, on everyday basis? That to me was a much more difficult question to answer. And I don't think I've provided an answer to that, but what I certainly hope is we could think of empathy as not in times of crisis, but as an everyday form of ethics, if possible. And to me, Hambastagi allowed some of those possibilities alongside solidarity. So the interview, when the Afghans interview would happen in German, they would call it solidarity. Um, but when it would happen through food and in the Dari language, it happened to encompass multiple meaning rather than one political meaning of solidarity. Let's see. Well, I think uh, what you've just gave us resonates deeply with many comments made today. Yes. Yes. So uh, I see some nodding, smiling faces. That's good. So maybe we can start a discussion and uh, let's get into it. I think uh, there's a lot to chew here together, so. <clears throat> Don't worry, Razak, they're only shy in the beginning. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's been proven empirically today, so. <clears throat> yes, Pradeep, please. Razak, on a more general level, um, you sound quite optimistic when it comes to the idea of decolonizing anything. Mm -hmm. And let me, um, let me try to defend, just in order to be provocative. Yeah. Um, let me defend a position which is more pessimistic mm -hmm. when it 
to decolonization. Let's take the example of solidarity that you are highlighting in your thoughts. Where is solidarity shown in our current times and who shows solidarity to whom? And I would say the normal case is that the West shows solidarity to the outlaws of the rest of the world. And rarely do you see, uh, as you know from your stay in Germany, Germany is suffering from quite a lot of right-wing extremism in different shades. Mm -hmm. But when I read Indian newspapers, for example, there's no solidarity with the larger German population that suffers from an increasing right-wing radicalism, right? Mm -hmm. But what we can see is that whenever refugees come, and of course they come from, from certain parts of the world to certain parts of the world, they do not show up anywhere. Okay. Um, so even the concept of solidarity itself cannot be thought of without the larger framework of colonialism and its own history, mm -hmm. I would say. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I think it's quite difficult to come up with a concept that cannot somehow be traced back to colonialism. And I'm not saying you should do that, but I would still say that it will be difficult to make an argument that such a concept cannot be related to colonialism, and that would be necessary in order to call it decolonized. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Uh, if I may, I think I one would try to engage rather than answer what you have said, because I think what you're asking is, and in some way, uh, I think I share that concern. I think uh, decolonizing can't be about a time before the colonial, because that would be an understanding of colonial as a temporality, when people moved there and things happened. But <clears throat> if one were to think of colonialism itself as both a knowledge form and one might even think of as a psychic form, then it would be hard to think of a space outside of the colonial. Uh, what I think is becomes interesting is, not to situate these as completely clean concept or untouched concept, but what I thought would be interesting would be to put them into concept that they are not meant to be with. So I'm, I'm interested in thinking of Afghan ideas of Ambastagi as a sociality in conversation with German debate about who enters the public sphere or what is the Gesellschaft. Has those concept created those spaces? Uh, is the Habermas sphere, which has been criticized for its bias to gender and <clears throat> other subaltern group, uh, what, what that public sphere would mean for 21st century debate? So in some way, what I was interested in thinking with, particularly uh, Afghan groups was how their sense of solidarity and sociality because of displacement has interesting ways of moving. So uh, the, the people I often work with, one of the reasons I could do this work was partly because of some, many Afghans experience in India. A lot of them had were refugee in India, but of course then India's own policy towards refugees has been particularly bad. Um, but it is also interesting that oftentimes the reaction to me varied. In political protest, I found resistance because people would often think I'm from Pakistan and then there would be, in the poster you may have seen, that was very much anti-Pakistan embassy sentiment because of Pakistan involvement in uh, Afghanistan. And sometimes it would change often once they know, knew that I was Indian. Uh, and then there would be some shared idea of a past in India. Um, it would vary, of course, and it would have to be negotiated and we would often create conversation or concept between language. But I have to also say that part of that difficulty or possibility of such a project was multilingualism for me, at least, which allowed us to think the interviews would often be at least in three to four language between Urdu, Dari, German, and English. 
so what you are emphasizing therefore, and I, if I'm understanding it correctly, is to think not them as separated concept, but perhaps what I was suggesting was to think across rather than against. And I'm suggesting this not as an optimist solution, but as a method to bring into the academia, which as pre in the previous panel we discussed, emphasize conclusions rather than a messy field itself. And by messy, I mean <clears throat> it positively, because then we are not coming with one concept, but, but a constantly shifting uh, negotiated concept. Uh, but I, I do share, I think it's not a pessimistic view, I think it's a realistic view, uh, which is governed from the, the nature of academic work itself, one might add, for its desire for conclusion rather than open-ended possibilities. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your talk. I, I was wondering uh, how we can think about this question of empathy, Hamastagi, solidarity, uh, spatially. Mm -hmm. So you gave images of, from Mulestrasse in vetting, uh, and then there's an image of the protests at the Brandenburg Gates. Of course, there are always in any uh, major city, there are certain sites for protest. Uh, they quite often place it high, highly symbolic places with great cultural value, uh, public value. Uh, whereas vetting, there's, uh, it's a contested zone now with gentrification uh, happening uh, and uh, battles between, or at least uh, tensions between uh, residents and cultural moving in. Um, and I wonder what the symbolic value of the, was it Kabul Nights, the, uh, the restaurant and then the market uh, that you showed as well. What, where, where are they located in the, in the cognitive mapping or the, in the imaginary of the uh, Afghani uh, uh, Berlin uh, community? And what, what, so just, that's the question. Is it a question? I don't know, but that's, that's, the, that's the question. That's the response. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think that's a, an important question and I emphasize uh, publicness, a particular public representation as crucial for subjects own self-making. So I, I would, you know, it's not like there were no Afghans before. What is important is the, in a way they are making the public presence felt. It's a form of public representation. Therefore, the insistence on the language representation, the insistence on getting artifact from Afghanistan, despite the difficulties of getting these, and also um, creating a restaurant named after a place in Afghanistan. That I think is interesting for me because for the longest time I know I thought this was hidden around Persian or Iranian uh, way. Of course, the many in the larger part of the essay, I also look at the menu where you know you can see the diversity and of different regions of Afghanistan. I don't want to give a suggestion here that Afghanistan Afghan community is so unified. For example, the Baraka restaurant has is more open to Pashto speaker, whereas I think the uh, Kabul night is more inclined to a Dari speaker. And some of those social spaces within wedding are also fractured. So it's not like a unified space. But what becomes interesting is to think of this neighborhood, particularly in wedding, as a place where Historically, I think, and you know, wedding is interesting because it's not just German and the migrant. It's a very migrant neighborhood, often many refugee community. So it's, it also becomes interesting to think of lower working class German or Polish people and what that allows to create forms of politics at the, let's say, not the progressive circles of Kreuzberg and Nordkorn, which I was not interested in because there is, there, there is a particular form of a very conscious form of political representation. So you would have food festival where they would create Jewish food festival or Syrian food festival. So that's, that's a state activist based idea of creating publicness. Whereas this is more uh, emanating from lower rents and 
ability of Afghan refugees to move from, you know, they, they are not rehabilitated in Meenat city. They often live in Shpanda or Daudskirt. So for them, this also becomes a part of participating in the city. Um, and I, at that level, I think wedding becomes interesting. I was curious why there seems to be such a strong presence here. And it's a desire to become part of the city and not remain on its margin. And therefore, the political work is not just happening at Brandenburg Gate. A lot of these uh, restaurants, for example, also raise money. So Kabul Nights, for example, has been raising money for musicians uh, uh, who've come from Afghanistan now to Hamburg. They also do charity work for uh, education work in Afghanistan. So I also want to suggest these are also sites of political uh, and ethical project and not just leisure, leisure activities. Thank you. Okay. Can I add? Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, see, you did not take Hamdardi, I was thinking, mm. uh, but you took Hambastagi. Uh, and that is very, very interesting, actually. Mm. Did not take Hamdardi which was kind of, you know, <laughs> on the plate for all of us. Uh, would you want to say a little more on that? Or would you see Hamdardi as more compassion? I'm not hearing the word. Uh, hum, the, chala, brother, you do it. I think. Dardi, yeah. do yeah. the dardi. <laughs> yeah. Handardi is a word that circulates between Persian, but more so in Urdu, which is the idea of to share the pain of other compassion, sympathy, possibly empathy. Uh, and this is why I went for Hambastiki because it is not just a kind of concept that's, which is about sharing the pain of other. It is also used for inhabiting, dwelling, sharing. So it, Hamdard- I found it very interesting actually. Yeah. That's why so, I, I asked this question, but go yeah. ahead. No, thank you for raising this uh, because I didn't want to complicate and present the entire metrics of other emotion concept. Yes, so the missing concept here is Hamdardi because I think they don't want Hamdardi. Oh, I, yeah. I think the idea, that that's what I was trying to say that empathy can also be exhausting for people who are at the receiving end of it. So the exhaustion of always being seen those who need support. Uh, so one of the practice, for example, we've learned in the uh, solidarity group that we work with, which is also called Hambastigi, is to actually have leisure activities like having music event or picnic, meeting in a park rather than in a specific refugee support group places. And I think the speciality of that matters. They want to be part of the city. They don't just want to be in offices where then they are given paperwork help or, I mean, all of that is important, but I think if one were to think of idea of work, uh, working with people uh, in terms of support and solidarity work, then one has to also think of uh, pleasure and not just empathy, joy. I think sometimes empathy is too invested in rescue fantasies that it forgets the joy of that. And this is where I thought Hamdardi was not the, the relevant word, which I would have expected based on my Urdu location. But the word I often encountered was in fact Hambastigi, which is a desire for not just sharing your pain, but also your pleasure, despite whatever situation you might be in. In fact, brother, doing this, and I was, that's why I was smiling when you ended, actually, that, oh my God, he did not use Hamdardi, mm -hmm. uh, but Hambastari. Uh, in fact, you are actually taking us a little away from that, uh, you know, from morning, we have been looking at that, the shoe metaphor mm -hmm. as Roland, mm -hmm. actually, that you have to feel the pain of the other mm -hmm. and of that and mental health. Yeah. Uh, all of that, which is perhaps important also. Let's not yeah. throw it away also. Yeah. But by moving to Hambastagi, you are actually kind of shifting us a little bit away from uh, the shoe metaphor, which has 
yeah. uh, dominate mm-hmm. thinking around them. If I may give an example from one of the interview in the essay, I interviewed this um, young Afghan uh, my refugee who has actually never grown up in Afghanistan, Nazneen. Um, Nazneen grew up in Iran and in Germany. She's studying in a German school. And I asked her about her connection with Afghanistan. And she said, I have no connection with Afghanistan. I've never seen the country. Uh, but for me, the food becomes a way for me to represent and tell about myself in my school. So she, in fact, invited during all this crisis last year. And, you know, people, of course, must have been asking her about a country and, you know, a country that she has not lived. And she said, I asked them to come and see this restaurant. And because for me, the food becomes a way of representing and myself. And she said, when the student and the universe, uh, school staff could eat the food and enjoy the pleasure, she said that for me was became like essence of fuel. Food became my emotional representation. And I, at that moment, became a subject who didn't have to explain, but I became the source of pleasure to my class rather than a source of concern. And she said, for me, that, that is why I work in this place. It becomes for me both a way of engaging with, with my own history, but also a form of representation that is not just about trauma, but also about pleasure and delicious food. And in that sense, food places become important. Why do migrant communities insist on, apart from having community spaces, food places? What, what is the function of those places? And also remember those non-Afghans who are coming here are at the end of the day also learning to see or at least appreciate Afghan food something that they may not know otherwise. The menu is very uh, interesting because it has not just Afghan food, Iranian, Indian, but also food for vegan friendly German food too. So it's, it becomes an interesting site to think of these places as forms of creating self-representation, which are beyond traumatic or uh, always in the need of empathy but sites of creating pleasure and uh, joy. And I don't want to insist the choice should be between one or two. Therefore, the, the work should be done both in political side, but perhaps to extend the idea of the political nature of empathy politics and insist on the joys of doing, being empathetic with the subject that we think needs a uh, rescue. Perhaps there's something there that might be of joy to those who think they could rescue others. It may turn out that people might find, discover self joy through others. Yes, and I think uh, in your sentence, not just support, but pleasure, you are um, making a certain, an intervention that we might say is psychoanalytic in the sense that you suggest moving from the level of support of what we might associate with the super ego's injunction of you must do, you must treat this poor object uh, to a level of pleasure of taking part in a community that distributes libido, that distributes pleasure. Yeah. And, um, you, you are saying that this is a, a more productive, uh, well, a productive way to look at things. I yeah, so. my hope is that Kabul night tells us also something about Germans and not just about Afghans. And that's that's the hope that what might the concept of Hambas Pegi reveal about German debates about Gesellschaft and not just as a paper or an inquiry about Afghan migrant communities, what a new form of political society or sociality that these places are attempting to create. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I just wanted to say I really like how you emphasize the multimodal aspect, you know, of tasting, feeling, and maybe narrating, um, you know, of empathy, or as you, well, or as Ambassagi, this is multimodal. That's something I was not cognizant of, and you've made that point very nicely. Thank you. So thank you, Razak. Well, bye.
Thank you very much for joining us today. And uh, I hope you'll visit here. You'll visit <laughs> very soon and we can. Uh, yeah, I apologize. It's a busy semester, but yes, uh, I'm glad I could join at least virtually. Thank no, you for the opportunity, Leon. Yes, of course. Um, so we're coming to, a, we've come to an end of the day. And um, I want to thank you all because you were quite fantastic. You were kind and you were inquisitive. It's just, just what we need. Uh, something, a side note, I want to say, you know, it, it, these events are always great and we had an experience. And well, if you're even 20% as exhausted as me, as me, I uh, feel a lot of empathy for you. Uh, but you know, <laughs> but but you know, it's, what, many times we just meet, convene, and we forget about it, right? Now, okay, I will I will hopefully keep in touch with the speakers because there's a lot of what they said that has to do with my work. But I I I suggest that well, you are all academics as well, and if anything today has something to do with your work. Would be good if we make something out of it right so something that i sort of invite you to do then as students as professors as the whatever right is to get in touch with me if you do feel that there is something that you would like to do with one of these experts or on one of these topics and we can connect you together and maybe something can grow out of it right so maybe it's not only the knowledge that we gain here, but maybe some collaboration, some uh, ambastagi that we can take part in uh, after this. So keep this in mind, and you have the KQC email uh, for those on the Zoom as well, and those here, of course. And yes, let's, um, yeah, I hope to see you in the Empathy and Society Colloquium 2023. So let's, uh, let's try and do that. Thank you. Okay.